Great job, guys. Thank you so much for that. So next up, we have a session about data. And I know what you're thinking, another boring data talk. Well, this is not that talk. We've got a couple of the most innovative companies in online data, and even more important, come on up, guys, the most exciting moderator in the entire AppNexus pantheon, <laughs> our own favorite Canadian, that's right, Michael Rubenstein. Take it away, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. And uh, that was not me. <laughs> I was not passing gas studies. Yeah. Deepak. Speaking of which, by the way, Brian looks great. He your does your look socks great. are relatively boring. They are. Comparison. They are. If I'd known about the dress code, I could have worn a Canadian tuxedo. <laughs> is that the shirt or what is that? That's uh, uh, jeans and jean jacket. Oh. <laughs> Acid um, wash or? No. I painted my toes for Brian, so. You can't. Actually, tell. your socks are pretty sexy there. Yeah. <laughs> I got it going on. So, speaking of things you wouldn't expect to see at an AppNexus summit, Ramsey. <laughs> you, you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but well, it's. Brian and I are friends. Contrary to popular, our, our kids play together. Uh, we've known each other since 2004. It's good to see that he's finally doing some of the shit I told them to do back then. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, it's great to have you as a partner, and it's great to have you on board. You know, and you and I have been working together also since around 2000 at DoubleClick. Long time, yep. I remember thinking back then you had an encyclopedic knowledge of online advertising, and uh, you were just getting started. Thanks. But congrats on everything at uh, ClearSpring. It sounds like an amazing opportunity. It is. And as Brian mentioned, you're doing some really innovative things. Could you just Give us a, a minute or two about where you're taking the company. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, ClearSpring is a social infrastructure and data company. Started five years ago providing functionality for premium publishers to push content into MySpace. We all know what happened with MySpace. Um, but what did happen was there was a recognition that there was value in this point-to-point -point sharing. So ClearSpring acquired a company called Add This, which is a social platform for the open web. Uh, over the course of three years, it's grown. We're on 12 million domains. We see 1.2 billion consumers. We get search data, contextual data, social data. The predominant model is free for use of data. Uh, so we've, we've built our, the company around social infrastructure, but based on the business model, uh, we, we essentially have become a data company who has grown up in social infrastructure. So it's this amazing opportunity to take tools and data and intelligence and tie them together in a way that predominantly started on the publisher side, giving you know, news companies like NBC or ABC the tools to understand how people are sharing, how to create content, that publishing value chain, how to, how to get people engaged into your site. Uh, but we've taken that data and actually started to apply it to advertising, which is really fascinating and uh, a huge growth market right now. Very exciting. Eric, you're the CEO of Data Logics. Also, as Brian mentioned, doing incredibly interesting things. Tell, give us a couple and of minutes. And you and I go back at least 30 minutes, right? Well, we go back at least 30 <laughs> minutes, but uh, we existed in similar worlds, I think, for some yes. time. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, tell us first about where you're taking Data Logics. Sure, yeah. So um, our focus at Data Logics is constructing kind of, we think, the first ever purchase graph of consumers. So where you hear about social graph and interest graph and so on. We've constructed the, the most comprehensive view of how U.S. consumers spend their money that anyone ever has. And we've been focused on CPG automotive and, and retail for similar reasons that Todd just mentioned. That's where, obviously, a tremendous amount of the advertising spend and consumer spend is. Uh, the kind of two challenges that needed to get solved to make this happen, one is aggregating um, consumer purchasing data from a host of sources, which we've done from over 1,500 sources. And um, importantly, um, over 90% of consumer purchasing still happens online. And if you look out five years from now, it's going to be about 89% of consumer purchasing. So that number is declining very, very slowly. And so you, you have to solve the offline data siloing um, uh, problem and marrying up big CRM data with the, with the digital media real-time world. And so kind of the data aggregation and then this marriage of offline and online are the two big problems we've had to solve. The kind of applications fall into two buckets. Um, one is to do better targeting based on what people have purchased before. 
and the other is to measure whether online advertising, digital advertising of any form, is truly driving somebody to buy something, regardless of whether it goes under DR or under a, more of a brand um, kind of strategy. You want to know, are you moving toilet paper or cars or, or credit card applications, et cetera? And so many of these um, purchases are still consummated offline. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And I know from our discussion before, I mean, one of the things that's really interesting about your business is obviously there's the new digital advertising component, but there's a huge amount of offline and old traditional direct marketing techniques and database marketing. And you know, I know from, from experience having been at DoubleClick, um, we had the digital side of the business and the abacus data side right, of the business. Right. And it was really oil and water, right? I mean, these were completely different types of people, types of businesses. There wasn't a whole lot of mixing. It sounds like at Data Logics, you're, you know, again, the theme of the, of the summit here is innovation. It sounds like you are using innovative techniques to actually kind of merge those cultures together. Yeah. How are you doing that? It's a great, great question. And I, I do think that's been one of the fundamental challenges. And I think it's one of the competitive moats kind of for us is that, um, we did a lot of hard, expensive, time consuming, emotionally draining work over the last three to four years of kind of forcibly, uh, forcibly kind of infusing the two strands of DNA, the database marketing DNA and the digital DNA. And I think we did that fundamentally in a way that was, um, as I said, quite costly and painful and time consuming. But um, it is a very difficult process. It has cultural issues. It has it literally, you know, where people were sitting, how people's incentives worked, et cetera. And I think w having got through the back end of that, um, I think it's a it's a very difficult thing for somebody to replicate now to get get somebody who's been a 20 year database marketing to mutually respect somebody who's um, you know half their age and and thinks that the world started with the internet kind of. And I, I think we've pulled that off. I don't know if I can say perfectly, but I, I think certainly we've, we've spent a lot of time on it and probably done it quite a bit better than, than others have. Yeah. And, and, it, and it may be the biggest challenge to your question. I think it's an astute question. <laughs> probably that the, the human factor stuff always tends to get underestimated. Yeah. I literally forced people to move in, in our office. Wow. In and you context. were telling me about some, some experimentation with uh, t-shirts? Oh yeah, yeah. That, you know what? That was a great experiment. I can't say it took off as much. I, I one of the ways that I showed that we we valued kind of our roots in our predictive analytics and direct mail. As I had everyone gave everyone in the, in the company I, I heart direct mail T-shirts, <laughs> and I think about you know six people who were digital DNA ever wore them out of like a hundred. But you know, I I certainly wore it and wear it proudly quite a bit still. Very cool. It's a good way to get things thrown at you on the playground with the kids, the I heart direct mail t-shirt. But <laughs> and it's a great way for those single, it's a great way to get chicks too. So. I bet. I bet. Ramsey, what about you? I mean, obviously you've been in this industry a long time and you talked about add this and some of the social characteristics that are happening in your business. How are you um, pivoting around the the bringing together of old and new? Yeah, the old on the publishing side, it's fascinating because you go out and you have conversations with the news editors uh, of the largest sites out there, and they're used to seeing something on a on a page, and going, "Yeah, I like that," you know, and it's intuition based. And then you actually start to show them how people are engaging. What what's the audience makeup? What's the virality? Where are they sharing? What are the nodes and edges? Uh, how are they? Uh, it, it actually it fundamentally changes the way they think about that publishing value chain of create audiences, get them engaged, monetize them, and then report on it. And so it's, just, it's been this fascinating people-oriented evolution to change the way folks are running business uh, in, a, in a more efficient and effective way. On the, on, the, on the advertising side, sort of the same thing, where buyers have historically bought context as a proxy for the audience. Fundamental shift starting in 07, even in right media days, every year there was an incremental uh, percentage of transactions where data was being used. And same story as, as on the publishing side, which is driving efficiency and effectiveness in advertising. Yeah, you, you mentioned to me a couple of weeks ago that you thought that data is the lifeblood, really, of making the RTB and the exchange ecosystem work, and you've got some views on where it's all heading together. Yeah. 
A absolutely. I think uh, it, where the DSP, where we're all headed to is one nice dashboard that gives us all the data on engagement and, and then what are you going to do in mobile, video, social, local, uh, offline. Uh, and, and so what we're seeing is uh, all, data is the oil that lubricates everything. And that DMP concept and, the, and then the ability to push the data or the intelligence into whatever buying platform or publishing platform, it still boggles my mind that we have different systems that do ad serving and publishing. Because all you're doing is taking data, taking a point of view, and then you're either applying it to how you engage with consumers who know your brand and are visiting your site, or trying to build awareness to bring more people to your site. So that concept is actually driving consolidation. In 2007, you saw the ad servers get picked up, and since then, huge consolidation in the paid media space. But more recently, what you see is a blurring of the line of paid, earned, and owned media. So when you have Facebook fan pages, Twitter pages, Pinterest pages, you have your own site, your, your, your advertising, there's a blurring of the line between how you engage. And so I think what we will continue to see is consolidation in the paid media, but you'll start to see systems that are more holistic, thinking about what happens on the site side, how do you create better engagement, deeper engagement, and then what do you do in paid media? And it's all connected through that underlying infrastructure of data. Eric, you think about the world the same way, obviously. You're working with huge brands whose business, as you mentioned, are primarily offline. On your website, you say it right up front, we're all about the data. And you become a big player in the RTB space and the exchange space as well. How do you think this is all going to evolve? Yeah, I mean, I think Ramsey's on the right thing. I think what's, what's interesting and a little bit daunting and why I think you guys are taking a great approach with the Accelerate program is the level of fragmentation that exists. So if you take it on the, the, uh, the, um, the post-candidate stuff and measurement and so on, it's amazing the extent to which the average campaign has people looking at you know, agencies and clients looking at a series of PowerPoints, this tool here, this tool here, to look at you know, what were the online engagement metrics. Here's a brand lift study that comes in from Dynamic Logic or Vizu across the transom. Here is, um, you know, in our case, we'll deliver the, the offline sales lift. And, and the ability to kind of unite all this stuff and have it drive insights, initially just with consistency and coherence, but obviously more and more synchronously with the campaign so that you can inform decision making in real time. It's very daunting to think about solving all those problems. And I think at some level kind of doing the kind of crowdsourcing that you guys are thinking about with the Accelerate thing, in addition to providing the seed funding, is, is near genius. And that's not seeded because I didn't know that was coming today. But, um, that's the way to answer a daunting problem, right? Is to turn the crowd loose on it. So, and probably not inconvenient for you guys if AppNex is at the middle of that uh, of that renaissance. <laughs> I uh, agree. I think it's a fantastic program. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And Eric and I were actually just talking about, gosh, should we allow people, startups, to have access to our data so they can just sort of fiddle around with it and figure out what they could do with it? And. Yeah. We will probably strip the PII first, just to be clear. But <laughs> we'll strip the PII. We'll strip the cookie, so you can play yeah, with the, it. Yeah. But then, if you actually want to apply it, you got to come talk to us. How do, how do you guys think about in your business using data for your own purposes as opposed to licensing it? Well, I think there's one interesting thing. If I'm if I'm completely honest, is there's always a certain element of you look if you're truly introspective and self-critical, you go there's a little bit of hypocrisy going on because I think there's always suboptimal use of data in one's own decision making, even as a data company. And it's easy to point the finger at others, but I, I would say, like everybody else, we struggle to make truly data-informed decisions every day. Because human intuition is so powerful and it's so expedient to just make a rapid fire decision. So that would be my honest answer to the question. Cool. Pass. They're perfect. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, uh, look, we struggle. Look, we're, uh, we're a startup. We have 100 people. Um, we're venture back tons of great investors in capital, and yet we still face the same sort of daunting, what resources do you have? What information do you have? How do you make decisions? Where do you prioritize? So we, we face the same sort of challenge. Cool. There's a lot of discussion right now, obviously, about data usage, um, regulation, things of that nature. How do you think this is going to play into the industry over the next several years? <laughs> you want that one? I, you know. <laughs> 
let me tell you exactly how it's going to play out. Quote me on it. So <laughs> this should be good. I think the vo you know I think the extent to which there is a consumer benefit. I think like anything else, uh, the benefit cost right the cost in kind of perception of reduced privacy, perception of freedoms encroached, perceptions of data vulnerability. Um, overlaid with the benefits. So you, you can think of like something, take something we're not involved in, just so totally objective here, the program that, that Twitter and Amex are doing together, which has been incredibly successful both in, um, in Word and, and in Deed. I was, I was, we were over there yesterday with, with Adam Bain talking about it, and it hasn't been overhyped in the press. It's been incredibly successful. The benefit to consumers is massive, right? I mean, they are, you know, they are getting in real time, if they've opted to be part of it, discounts that apply to the American Express card. So the, the more, if you get the cost benefit uh, trade off right, and you don't do anything stupid, like be a reckless custodian of data wherever you sit in the chain, I think that this will all come to a good end. That, that would be the, the, the boldest prediction I'm willing to make. Cool. I, I think it'll come to an end. <laughs> uh, there, there's, there, look, there's a law. Of, even I mean, that's going out on a limb, by the way. Yeah, right? that's because yeah. it may not come to an end. But actually, that's right. Now, I think what happens. Watch out for the law of unintended consequences, which is if the the regulatory bodies step in and move to some opt-in, some very onerous opt-in or a modified opt-in. Think about what publishers want to do. They want to mitigate their costs and mitigate their risks. So what do they do? They use single sign-on because it's a frictionless way to get people to sign on. Facebook, Twitter, Yahoo. So what's the impact of that? The impact of that is that you, you just consolidated the marketplace very rapidly to a few people who have that first party consumer relationship right. who then set the rules for the market. And, uh, and, and given the state that we're in, the nascent state that we're in, I don't know that that's really what you want to do. So I think the self-regulatory guidelines are good. I still think single sign Han has a lot of value. Mm -hmm. Think of a publisher who only was targeting on cookies and now gets a consumer to opt in and now has graph data. Look, I, I, I want to be in the middle of that, helping them figure out what do you do with anonymous and and personal data, and how do you change the experience? So I think that's an opportunity, but watch out for the law of unintended consequences. Right. Very cool. Do we have time for a couple questions? Okay. Let me open it up. You know where the mics are. Hey guys. Hey Jesse. Um, how are you? Yes. Good. So I just have a quick question on mobile and marrying the data to mobile devices and what the plans are, the privacy implications. You want to go first? We have different challenges around that. Yeah, it, uh, challenging because the, in mobile the, the the platforms tend to be more closed, um, so that that first party relationship is a lot more important. So I think. The, the companies that are moving into mobile have to spend a lot more time figuring out what their consumer brand is and what that direct consumer value prop is rather than, or facilitating it for someone who does have a first party. I think it's a very different environment. Uh, we have a fair amount of mobile activity, but we think about it as a product differently than we do the, the display space. Yeah, I would say, same is true for us. I think this actually gets to the last point Ramsey made, right, where mobile is a, an example of much more of a kind of walled garden controlled access ecosystem so that it's much more likely that as our, as our mobile presence gets bigger, and it exists now, but it's relatively small, it's probably going to over-index against working with companies who have large existing mobile reg bases as opposed to kind of our own cookie pool or independent portable audience. So I think that's going to be the biggest difference between mobile, which is, again, to Ramsey's point, a little bit unfortunate from just a, um, an openness standpoint. But I, just, I think that's going to be inevitably the way mobile looks. Um, with, with the one exception, you know, there's companies, most of the companies who, whose genesis are, is, in the, um, is in the fraud space, companies like Iovation and 41st Parallel and, and Blue Kava and so on. If they can truly crack the nut on some of this device ID and so on, that might be one, one back door. The privacy implications are still very much TBD on that, on that front. All right, thanks. Sure. Hi. Um, question about uh, 
sharing data and uh, the regulations. Do you think there's any opportunity with uh, to expose to consumers how how their data is used and potentially show them the benefits of that, or you know, what what should consumers know about data basically? Look, I I think they should know everything. I I think the more the more trusted environment that you create, the the less problems you're going to have. So, you know, what when I was at Yahoo, they created the ad interest manager, advertised it, exposed it, come in. We'll show you the data that we have. Change it if you want, delete it if you want. And that created a an environment of trust. I think we have to do the same thing. The consumer has often been the silent participant in the transaction between buyer, seller, and intermediary of advertising. And the more you enable the consumer to understand what's going on and be a part of that transaction, uh, I think the better we are as an industry. I think the, the, one, uh, the one complicator, because I agree with Ramsey, is you can rapidly get into the situation that a number of publishers have found themselves in with their privacy policy where it becomes completely unwieldy. So you know, in cases where we have thousands of data elements around a, about a consumer, the, probably the most user-friendly experience is going to require some level of curation to present that data to them in a way that's meaningful and where they can make meaningful editorial decisions other than a strict opt-in, opt-out, which they can obviously do now. And I would say that's still something I think that we in the industry are figuring out. What, what's the right level of granularity to expose? I think the everything, a lot of people, the people who are most likely to be interested and nervous about this are going to be the least likely to kind of understand and appreciate a 50-page 50 pa 50 scroll down or printout of all these kind of arbitrary segments and so on. So I, I think that does create a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, actually, I think it's a great point. It, it sort of speaks to our, our data set, because we're a foot deep and a mile wide across the web, and you're in three categories and a mile deep. So the way we present it to consumers. Might be, yeah, it might be easier for change. you guys. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome to figure out our challenge there, though, and happy to implement it. I'll put that on the list. Uh, Russ Glass uh, at Bizzo, curious about the ownership issues. Um, you know, we're seeing evidence out there, even in large companies, agencies, trading desks of, um, you know, things like retargeting off of ad impressions in order to capture data and not have to pay for it next time around. As you grow this ecosystem and have more and more startups, um, how do you control ownership of data? How do you make sure that the, the right parties are, are getting paid for the value they're creating? I think for a great question, I think for us the challenge is the kind of unknown unknowns. If I, if I knew how to quantify data leakage, I could at some level build that into our pricing. Uh, to be honest, the way I'd frame that question for us right now is I don't, we like to think that we do businesses with companies that we trust and who would not abuse the data, but I think in many cases, there are gray areas and people don't even know it's necessarily happening because there's algorithmic stuff going on in the background. And I don't think we, if I'm honest about it, I don't think we know enough about how big a dent that's taking into things to think about how to account for that economically yet. I think it's inevitable that it occurs, again, not necessarily through malintent, although there's probably some bad actors, but more likely just through the, the pace of innovation, there's literally leakage as opposed to the real theft. I just, I just don't know how to, how to deal with that problem yet. I think it's, it has started with the IAB Terms and Conditions B2 that got released that, that are now explicit as to rights of usage of data. That was a painful process that started in, in 08. The V1 was silent, and so everyone interpreted that the way they wanted. So it starts at industry, setting expectations. And then actually, at a business level, there are technical things that we can start to do. Think about what the direct mail houses do. They will set up fake post office boxes and just sit there and wait to see what comes in. And then once they see something, it triggers an audit and they go in and they, you know, they fine the company for doing it. There are, dis there are digital equivalents of that. So I think you're going to see more monitoring around that that leads uh, that leads us to only edge cases of that funny business and not, not a common practice. Cool. Guys, thank you very much for taking the time. Thanks for being great partners. Yeah. And, Thanks for uh, having us. Yeah, yeah we look forward to working with you more. Good stuff. Appreciate Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.